Okay, so uh, I'll continue today by, uh, first I give you the reference I forgot to give you yesterday. And uh, so what did we do yesterday anyway? Uh, yeah, so the main thing, uh, just as a brief recapitulation, so yesterday we deduced this, the composition of on-shell momenta in four dimension. We introduced this phase ambiguity and similar for delta tilde, under which a elicity state transform in this way. And we use this to constrain, we saw that this gave a very strong constraint on, on scattering amplitudes, and particular for four particles, we had the very simple formula So useful references in this context. So there are uh, the textbook by Wang and El Wang, which is on the archive. Uh, there's an older uh, long paper by uh, Arkani Hamed. Cachazo and, uh, and Kaplan, I think, which discuss a lot of what I've mentioned. And I will mention today. And for integrability in general, in the, con the connection with amplitudes, there's a very useful review by Beiser and many others, 10, 12, point three nine eight two. Uh, so today, the plan is to discuss uh, how we go from trees to loops using unitarity. And tomorrow, we'll also discuss unitarity again, but in the context of understanding renormalization. So what we understand about renormalization of quantum field theory from this Anshul perspective. So one thing I will do tomorrow is derive, for example, the QCD better function. But I will also show you how more generally you can recognize this 2 to 2 amplitude as the dilatation operator of the theory and you may not have recognized this object, but this object is the Eisenberg XXX pin chain Hamiltonian in disguise. So I will explain how to read that off tomorrow, and I will discuss integrity more, more generally. So that's the, the, the plan. So before we get going to loops, to be useful to tool up about supersymmetry because the loops will turn out to be much simpler in uh, supersymmetric theories. Uh, so we want to use, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, many of you are familiar with uh, superspace, which uh, you can use to simplify uh, supersymmetric theories. For n equals one supersymmetric, you have, it's relatively simple, but still you have, you have to introduce auxiliary fields and things like that. For n equals two supersymmetry, it becomes more and more complicated and not Feasible. The good news is we only need on-shell SUSY, which is much simpler. So how do, so when you have supersymmetric theories, you have supersymmetric generators, which are spinners. So you have additional symmetries in the theory labeled by spinners. Let's consider n equals one SUSY, for example. So you have one of these spinners. So we need to understand how it acts on a non-shell state. By the Lorentz environment and the fact that things depend only on, on lambdas and lambda tildes, this must be proportional to lambda alpha times another state with the same momentum. And if that state's at elicity h, because of this little group rescaling, you know that this state has elicity plus a half. So that, asked, so that that we know immediately. So 
if we look, for example, the gauge multiplet in n equals one SUSY, it has spin one, it has a state with spin a half, doesn't have any scalar, it has a complex conjugate of the gauge geno, and it has a minor statistic group. So these are the states in your theory. And Q takes you up. So if Q acts on the state, you would get on this fermion, so that would be the, the gluon, that would be a fermion, that would be a fermion, that would be a gluon. Q acts on this fermion state, you get positivistic gluon. But if Q acts on the positivistic gluon, you just get zero because there's nothing else to get. And similarly, there's a complex conjugate field, which gives lambda tilde alpha dot, which move you down. These are consistent with the anti-commutation relation of the Q, because if you act on pH, one takes you up, the other takes you down. You get just lambda lambda tilde, which is P alpha alpha dot times pH. And you now get a factor of two, because in this product, there's always only one term which contributes. So you go up, yeah. So, yeah. so that's Anshel Susi. It's very simple. And, yeah. In n equals four, so I could give you the Lagrangian of the n equals four supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory, but all I will need really is just the matter content in it. So I will not bother give you the Lagrangian. And in n equals four symmetry, you have the same story, but now you have four of these Qs. So, so you have Q alpha A, and A runs from one to four. And this A is a, uh, uh, it's called the SU4 R symmetry of the theory. The state now, there's a plus tilde gluon, so if you make a table of the spins and the number of states, at plus tilde, you have the gluon. For now, we have four fermions because you can act with four different Qs. You have six scalars, four of the complex conjugate fermions, and one gluon. So, in n equals four, you only have. Is it on? Okay, is it better? Now? Okay. Yeah, so. so already one thing you can see is simpler in N course four is that everything fits instead of one multiplet, which is very nice because we have we can have we can stop using all these discrete labels like plus minus for the amplitude. Now everything is one single super object. So how do we use this in practice? Well, we make a generating functional. How to unify the states together into a multiplet? So the Anshell superspace is defined as follow. A state with P and eta is defined as, we start with a plus stylistic gluon. Then we add eta A times the states with Fermion, so, make, so we introduce Grassmann variable eta, four of them, and we make series expansion like that. Eta A, eta B over two. And these A, B are anti-symmetrical. They parameterize, they label the six scalars of the theory. And then A, e, B, C, D, or three factorial, eta A, to be A to C. The other fermion. And then E, as you would have guessed, the next term has all the eras. And the gluon at the bottom of the multiplet. So we make this, this, this 
And yeah, that is the Angel superspace. We have momenta and we have these etas. Now, SUSY is very simple. It's just a differential question. Well, if we take Q on this, so yeah, if we take Q on this, we move, uh, 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 we move up. And that's equivalent to, uh, uh, to multiplying the whole multiplet by eta. So the representation of the SUSY now is simply Q alpha A is equal to lambda A, eta A, when it acts on Pn, P eta. And Q tilde moves you the other way. Move to the other way. And to move the other way, you need to take a derivative. And yeah, sorry, the index is down. So that's Q and Q tilde in this representation. So that allows you to, to move up and down in the multiplet. That helps us write the amplitude because now when we scatter four of these super states, we get a super amplitude which is a function of the momenta and these, these guys. So it's only a function of, if you wish, this super momenta, this super space. And now we no longer have any of these discrete labels. But this amplitude is some polynomial in the era because all the states are polynomials. And the fact that this theory is supersymmetric is just a statement that QA is zero is equal to Q tilde. That's, that's what we get from Susie. A very efficient way to solve this constraint Remember that another, constra another similar constraint that we have is that the, and, and Q is the total momentum, so it's the sum over all particles of the of this generator acting on that particle. We already have seen one such equation, is that sum over i of pi of a is equal to zero, and the way we solve this constraint is saying that the amplitude is proportional to a momentum conserving delta function. So the way we solve this constraint is similar. We just say that there's eight of these Qs. Here there was four of these Ps. Now there's eight of these Qs, four indices here, and, and spinner index here. This is delta eight, somewhere I, Qi, times something. And we call this uh, curly A for the moment. So the amplitude has to be proportional to this factor. You could try to do this. Uh, uh, you, you could try to add another delta function for Q tilde. But because Q tilde doesn't really commute with Q because it's a derivative operator, writing a delta function of derivative doesn't really work in practice. So we can't do that. So that's the best we can do. We can make the Q supersymmetry manifest by pulling out this factor. And then the Q tilde supersymmetry is just some differential equation that A happens to satisfy. So that's Angel Suzy. Let's work an example. So for the four particle amplitude, uh, for Grassmann delta function. Remember, are just polynomial. So this delta function here is definition is a product. Spinner index goes from one to two. Product uh, R symmetry index goes from one to four of some of particles of QI alpha A. It's a product of things. That's what Susie delta functions are. Grassmann delta functions are. So this. Each of these Q is dimension one now, so this whole thing is dimension four. So this Susie amplitude will be related to this thing, but having this 
a dimension four factor strip. And I'll just tell you the answer. The SUSY amplitude is equal to this Grossman delta function divided by the denominator, which was there. So let's check this formula in some examples. So the idea of this super amplitude is that it encodes simultaneously the amplitude for all the virus helicities in the theory. Is this delta function of Q? Yeah, that's the sum over all particles of their lambda and times eta. And this lambda has a spinner index, this A has a R symmetry index, so there's eight different things you can write down. That's why there's delta to the eight. So I, let me suppress them. So let's study this formula in some example. So let's first reproduce this case, minus, minus, plus, plus. To get minus, we have to extract the component where eta 1 will occur to the fourth power. So the amplitude for minus, minus, plus, plus is equal to the super SUSY amplitude where you extract four powers of eta 1, four powers of eta 2, and no powers of the rest. Remember, this thing's a polynomial of degree 8 in the etas. So we extract this particular coefficient of it. All the, all the eta 1s and all the eta 2s. How do we do that? Let's just look at the, and yeah, this here really means eta 1, r symmetry 1, the 1, r symmetry 2, 3. I hope you will not, the labels are a bit confused when you start writing them out, so I will. But that, that's really what this means. Because each of the eta squared to zero, you cannot have one of them twice. So let's, let's extract this. Let's just, let's just look at one R symmetry component. Let's look, and let's just look at the eta one and eta two parts. So we have lambda one, eta one, plus lambda two, eta two, say R symmetry one, and lambda is a spinner, so we get two cases. We have a product of this. Two, two, and these are our, our symmetry index. So that's alpha equal to two. This is alpha equal to one. Sorry, this is spinner index. So we're, this product contains this. And we, have to, we want to extract the component proportional to Eta 1, 1, eta 2, 1. So we can get this component from two places. We can get this part, this guy times this guy. That gives us lambda 1, alpha equal 1, lambda 2, alpha equal 2. Or we can get the other product, and because they anti commute, we get a minus sign. And this is the determinant of this. Product. So this is what we call one, one, two yesterday. So yeah, remember that lambda is a two spinner, and this pro so this product is just the determinant of this two by two matrix lambda one, lambda two. So at the end of the day, extracting eta one eta two just means to take a factor of one two. So in practice, it's very simple. So when we take delta eight e lambda eta, and we extract eta 1 to the 4, eta 2 to the 4. We've done it from one R symmetry index. If we do it to the four, for the four guys, we just get it to the fourth power. And that's how you see that this formula reduces that one as a special case. But this formula contains much more information. For example, now we can scatter scalars and so on. If you want to scale, scatter a scalar, for example, uh, yeah. 
can erase that. Let's consider the amplitude for negative elastic gluon, a plus elastic gluon, scalar 1, 2, and its complex conjugate, scalar 3, 4. That will be just equal to the super amplitude with error 1 all the fourth power, then eta 3, 1, eta 3, 2, eta 4, 3, eta 4, 4. This, this is how we extract that particular scalar component. And that, let's look at the, uh, let's look at the R symmetry 1. We have 1 and 3. So we get the factor of 1, 3. R symmetry 2, we get 1 and 3 again. R symmetry 3, 1 and 4. So it's completely trivial to convert this expression to spinner brackets. And downstairs, we have, again, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1. This guy cancels up to a sign. And yeah, so that's the amplitude for scalars. And that, if what, what is this amplitude? So, so we could have computed it in Feynman diagrams. This, con this includes this diagram. So scalar, gluon, gluon, plus this diagram, or gluon exchange. And also the, the diagram with the four-point vertex. So without actually doing them, we've computed the sum of these three Feynman diagrams. And we can also similarly extract amplitudes with fermions and so on. Yeah. And the amplitudes will be the same as in, as in QCD. Even though we've done n equals 4, the same diagrams will occur in QCD. So that's Anshel Suzy. Now, let's discuss loops. The basic method to relate loops to trees is unitarity. It's called like that because it, it's related to the statement that the S matrix is a unitarity matri unitary matrix. So S is DAG equal to 1 means you can derive that imaginary part of T is equal to T dagger T. And if you draw this DAG, this, if you expand this equation at weak coupling, it gives you something like the imaginary part of some one loop amplitude is equal to a product of three amplitudes. Let's put it like that. And on this cut, all the propagators are, are on shell. The, the, the Kutkowski formula allows, you to, allows us to be more, more explicit. This imaginary part is, if we imagine that only this channel is, is, uh, is, is time-like, Kotkowski give us that this imaginary part is equal to, for example, this integral when it's cut. And the cut means to replace each propagator by, well, yeah, I over p square plus i epsilon minus it goes to 2 pi delta of p square. Put all propagators. Yes, yes, sorry, that's too small, yeah. Yeah. Well, what I want to say is that propagators are replaced by 2 pi delta of p squared times uh, normally you retain only the positive energy. So, so the, yeah, the way we use that, so this is, unitarity is normally, in this equation, it's, it's a statement about the integrated expression. If you take the imaginary part of this loop, it's equal to replacing this propagator by delta function. 
and putting the three amplitudes on the left and on the right. The unitarity method extends this to a statement you can check at the level of the antigram. So that was done by, uh, was pioneered by uh, uh, Byrne, Dixon, Dunbar, and Kosovar in the mid 90s. And the idea is simple is that if an antigram If an antigram has all the correct cuts, then it's the correct antigram. So what does that mean? All the correct cuts mean that on all cuts you replace one over p square by a delta function. And you do that for all the possible channels you can imagine. So you take your integral, so you put these two propagators on shell, and you compare what you get with the product of two three-level amplitudes. And you do the same thing for the other channel and, 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 uh, and, and, and the cross channels. One, two, If you do it for all channels and it matches in all cases, then you got the full integral, and that's that's enough. So that's a, a well, uh, yeah, Byrne, Dixon, Dunbar, and Kosover. Let's let me quickly illustrate this in a simple example, and then I will uh, uh, mention what are the sum of caveats and, and subtleties in extending this uh, this approach to. Uh, Fire loops and in general. Let me just quickly give an example uh, uh, of this to make it le less abstract. And the example, I will do the example in N course four. As you will see, it will, because the integral will be much simpler there, it will allow us to do it on the board. Let's consider the amplitude for. One loop amplitude for minus again this again this one minus two minus three plus four plus and now let's look at this cut here. So we need to calculate the product of three amplitudes on the left and on the right. On the left we have so let's on the cut, let's call the momentum on the cut L and L tilde. And here we have this four particle amplitude, which is two minus three plus. And then on the right, we have some other three level four point amplitude, which is four plus one minus. And we have to sum over the elicities in the cut. Let's first do the case where we have a plus here and a minus here. So it's a minus plus on the other side. So this three amplitude we know, it has this Park Taylor denominator, which is two three three L tilde L tilde L L two. Then the similar thing the other side, this gets square. Then you have L L tilde four four one. 1L, but the important thing would be the numerator here. The numerator takes the form, so the two minuses are this, so we get L2 to the four of this guy on the left, and we get L tilde, L tilde one on the right. So that comes from, let me, that comes from gluon loop, so I'm having gluon in the intermediate state. And there's another case for gluons where it's minus plus. And that case gives, when, when I flip this, I get simply one into exchange, but n and l to the exchange, so now it's l1, four, l2, four. 
That's the gluon contribution to this loop. Now let's include the fermion contribution. So in n equals 4, there's 4 fermions, so we have a minus 4. And remember, each time we, we, we uh, 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 as we saw here, to take a fermion amplitude, we'll essentially move one of these eta's from site 1 to site 2. And that will simply change one of these pro products. So let's call this product 8 to the 4. Let's call this b to the 4. We'll get simply a cube b plus a b cube. That's what we get from fermions. And that's because this fermion amplitude here, if this is, let me do it in more detail. If I put this, this amplitude is simply the minus half times the 2 gives 2L tilde 3, and this gives L, L, yeah, 2L, 2L to the 1. So somehow changing, moving the elicities around, just, just change whether we have L tilde or L in the 2. So that's what we get from fermions. And for scalars, now we get plus 6, A2, B2. And you see that something nice happens when you have precisely this combination. And now we get A minus B to the fourth. And A minus B, let me write it in full, it's L2, L tilde 1, minus 1, 2. And remember, there's indeed density when you are anti-symmetrize things in a two-dimensional two vector space. That, so that gives simply L, L tilde, 1, 2, 4. So in n equals 4, you get an extremely simple expression for the cut. Whereas in QCD, you have this, this, this mess. And, yeah. Uh, So now, let's continue with this statement. So if the integral allows the correct cut, then it's the correct integral. So we want to, this expression is valid when n and l tilde are on shell. We want to uplift this to an expression which is valid everywhere, even when they are off shell. So let's, let's rewrite this a little bit. So, okay. And it's be useful to this whole expression to pull out the three amplitudes. So this will be 1, 2, the 4, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 1, times something. And then we get two LL tildes on top. And that takes care of this. 2, 3, and 4, 1 are there. Uh, the 1, 2, the 4 is there. But we have extra 1, 2, and 3, 4. And here we have L1, L2, L tilde 3, L tilde 4. One thing I will, that's a technical statement that you can uh, uh, explain uh, how to, there's some identities that allows to simplify that further. The physical expectation is that what can be in the denominator should be written as normal propagators. That you expect on physical grounds. And indeed, you can show that this expression, the denominator, is equal to 1 over L minus P1 square, L over P2 square. So the way to rewrite this, the point is that this L tilde is not an then from L on this unitary cut because of momentum conservation. So you can rewrite this expression in terms of normal propagators. And, but you always expect to be able to do that on physical grounds. And the numerator turns out to be just st. So what have we learned? We've learned that, so on this cut, the integral is the same as what you get from cutting integral d4l of s t l square l minus p1 square 
L minus P1 minus P2 square, L plus, uh, sorry, P2, uh, P4 and P2 square, which is just a uh, scalar. So these are the five propagators you would have in that box. If L is here, uh, one, how did I label these things? One, two, three, four. So yeah, these are the four propagators in the scalar box. So the antigram on this cut is exactly what you'd get from cutting this box. Now we have to check the other cuts. So we have to check, in principle, that determines the integral up to things which don't have both of these propagators at the same time. So it determines the integral up to just product of essentially these other propagators. But the other cut, trust me, because of the symmetry of this problem, gives exactly the same expression. And that's the full answer. So yeah, if you were to compute the, the other cut, you would find exactly that it's consistent with that. And that proves that the one loop integral in this theory. In other words, so A one loop is equal to the three amplitude times this box integral. So that's the idea of the unitarity method. You compute the integral of all the cuts and you match that integral with some, you try to uplift these cuts to a full integral which is valid away from the cuts. And that's completely general. You can apply this idea in QCD also. It has nothing to do with supersymmetry. But some important things happen in supersymmetric theories. Yeah. yeah so I can raise that. So that's the principle. And one thing is that the integral needs regularization. And so here I've done all the calculation in d equal four. Yeah, so for, yeah. But in general, for example, if you use dimensional regularization, you want uh, the full expression. And, and dimensional regularization is what people normally use in this field. And you're forced to introduce a regulator because, as we'll see uh, eventually, but yeah, this integral has infrared divergences. Here it doesn't have UV divergence. In QCD, it will also have UV divergences. You need to regulate. And okay, the conventional choice is dimensional regularization. And a useful way to think about it in this context is that your momenta, your d-dimensional momenta, consist of a four-dimensional of a four-dimensional part where mu goes from one to four, plus an extra-dimensional part. It's called mu perp, which has index mu equal zero to minus two epsilon. So there's a normal part and the extra dimensional part, such that the full d-dimensional p square, let me remove this d, is equal to p square plus mu perp square. And that allows you to write d4 minus 2 epsilon as d4 p d minus 2 epsilon mu. And now we have an integral which depends on this four-dimensional part in this extra part, which is essentially a mass. You can do that. Yeah, you can always do that. And that is a, a, it's a very useful way to think about it. And yeah, uh, in this, uh, 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 yeah, it's discussed in, uh, so it's discussed in the uh, Wang and Elvan reference. Yeah. It's a useful notation. But the point is that what we've computed here Spinner elicities. So there's language. Uh, so we're using the massless amplitude and this lambda and lambda tilde notation. We only get the amplitude when 
this mu perp is equal to zero. This wall formalism is intrinsically four-dimensional. And we don't get this extra dependence on this. And that can be dangerous because sometimes you can have naively the dependence on, there's only epsilon of these. Naively, it's, uh, it should be order epsilon. But sometimes you can have integrals, for example, of this type, L square plus new perp cube. And because of uh, this, by symmetrical integration, becomes epsilon L square. So we think that's the order epsilon, because it's only epsilon of these guys. But this integral diverge, so you get epsilon over epsilon, which gives something order one. So because of such epsilon over epsilon effects, you have to be really careful. And here you could worry that this is not the complete answer. You could add extra terms proportional to mu square. What? This gentleman probe in the mid-90s, Byrne, Dixon, Dunbar, and Kosover, they proved that in SUSY theories, the UV behavior is better. Remember that one of the point of SUSY is to make the UV behavior better to solve the hierarchy problem. So the UV behavior is better in, in, SUSY, in SUSY theory in such a way that in such a way that Suzy theory, these mu square terms never produce epsilon or epsilon. So you don't need them to compute. They're not needed to get A to order epsilon 0, which is what we really care about, the four-dimensional limit of the amplitude. Just one. Just One's one. enough. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. So that's an important statement, and this is why this calculation was correct and sufficient. Uh, one thing I would like to see is that yeah, these epsilon over epsilon effects are called rational terms. So uh, it's kind of a interesting. Uh, 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 they're really uh, uh, painful to calculate in general. And uh, this is where uh, uh, the, the the calculation of one-loop amplitude by now is sufficiently understood that people are automating computer programs for LHC calculation. But these computer programs typically spend all, all of their time getting this epsilon or epsilon effect. Because all the other effects you can get very efficiently using this four-dimensional language. So it's, it's a very important, in, pra for pra in practice, it's are very important uh, uh, terms. Very, very difficult questions associated with them. One way to think about them in, for example, they're not there in supersymmetric theory, and you can also imagine uh, softly broken. If you, if you start from, so one way to get per Young Mills is to take n equals one super Young Mills, where you add a fermion, but then softly break the SUSY so that you take the mass of the fermion to infinity. And because you have supersymmetry in the UV, it's good enough you can still work in four dimension, but now you need to have this extra massive particle. So this is why I introduced this notation here, because somehow this mu is very similar to, to the mass of this gay genome. And what you need in practice, you need, so if you want to do a per angular calculation, to get the rational terms, you need to include a gay genome loop where the gay genome goes to infinity. So, yeah. People have discussed these loops. Uh, uh, you can find this in, in the literature. There are techniques to get that. But yeah, the basic reason this, these things don't decouple is that you have integrals of the type integral d4l m square. And it matters only that l goes to infinity. So let me write all the propagators the same. 
if you have this integral, for example, if you take the limit m to infinity, you might think you have m8, m4 over m8, you might think it's just zero. But that integral, I put a pi square here, it's just one over six. It's not zero. And so you could say that the limit m goes to infinity. But if you take the limit under the integration sign, you will miss this term because it looks like you, look, you get zero. So you have to carefully keep the mass and compute these things. Of course, the more mathematically correct statement is that this limit is a distribution, which is delta function at, it's a bit subtle, it's L to infinity here, but yeah. But this is not developed. So if one would like to have a framework in which one can make such statements. Uh, and that should be the computing. Instead of having to calculate this whole massive amplitude and take the limit, effectively all we want is the coefficient of this delta function. But this is not developed yet. So I wish I would be able to talk about it, but it doesn't exist. But hopefully uh, in the next few years will be developed. And this leads to all sort of a, a questions at, so at one and two loops, how do we deal with, with this? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. How do we use this d equal four amplitude to compute? You would like to be able to massless d equal four. We're doing calculation in, for example, in periangles, which has these massless gauge fields. The three level amplitude are especially simple when we have massless particles in d equal four. And we would like to be able to use this simplicity to completely build loops. And right now it's failing because of these contact terms. But hopefully this, this would be uh, these contact terms, or if you wish, these epsilon or epsilon effects. So, yeah. That, that's, I think it's an important open question. And as you go to wire loops, keeping track of all these FX become increasingly painful. Yeah. So, uh, when did I start? How much time do I have? 10 minutes? Okay. So what I will do in these 10 minutes is I will discuss the extreme simplicity of this result, that the one loop amplitude is proportional to just the scalar box. And the simplicity turns out to not be an accident. It's a consequence of a, it has a symmetry explanation. Yeah, keep that. It's a symmetry which is special to planar and course four super young middle. It's called dual conformal invariance. Invariance in, in planar and course four. So what is this invariance? Let's see what special, what's the special symmetry of this object. If you just stare at this, you, you, you probably don't see it. The symmetry is revealed by, by introducing this notation to make it look more symmetrical. So uh, let's one, two, three, four. Instead of having a loop momenta, let's introduce region variables, y1, y2, y3 y4, and write this integral as integral d4 y0 over y0 minus y1 square, y0 minus y2 square. So I haven't done anything. I've just, I'm just saying that each of these probators is L or y0 minus something. 
And I haven't told you what these some things are, so I haven't done anything yet. But you get the right answer, provided that all you need is that yi minus yi minus 1 is equal to pi. So if every time you go from one propagator to the next, you add a pi, then that's the same expression. But now it looks much more symmetrical. And actually, the numerator is important. st, that's s, for example, is uh, t is p2 dot p3. That's y3 minus y1 square. So the integral is this. Now it looks more symmetrical. And now we can start to ask what the symmetries are. Yeah, let me keep this. Y i minus y i minus one equal to pi. Yeah, these are four vectors. The claim is that if you take y i mu goes to, then if you take an inversion, this thing goes to itself. So it has an inversion symmetry in momentum space. Let's just check the claim. We take yi minus yj square. It's a simple exercise to show that this goes to yi minus yj square over yi square yj square. I just need to check that. There's this three terms. You can, you can check it easily. This, so let's check that this is invariant. So from this factor, we apply the inversion to this factor, we get an extra y1 square, y3 square. But from the denominator, we also get one factor of y1 square here, one factor of y3 square here, this cancel. From the inversion, we also get y0 square to the fourth. But this exactly cancels the Jacobian of d for y0. So when you include the Jacobian, you do the inversion of our y1, y2, y3, y4, y0. This goes exactly to itself. And okay, it's a standard result about conformal symmetry that when you have translation symmetry and inversion symmetry, you have a full conformal symmetry, which is uh, uh, that case is SO24, SO42 conformal. So I as this word symmetry. So one can, yeah. Okay, I don't need this. So the, yes? Yeah. Yes, so the, that's the first question you could ask. Is this a one loop accident? Just look at one loop four point. It's not a lot of data. No, it's not an accident. It's there at all loop orders and for all, all number of external legs, it's there. Yes, and even the three amplitudes have them. I will actually discuss uh, uh, tomorrow. Uh, so what I want to say, yeah, so they don't have time to properly discuss the physical interpretation of the symmetry today. I can mention a bit of history. So in this very specific context, this, was on this, this, uh, this symmetry was obtained by uh, Aldi and Mendesina as a T-duality, a strong coupling of the uh, ADS5 cross S5 string theory, which is dual to this N equals 4 theory at strong coupling. It was uh, Aldi and Mendesina in 2007, I think. Uh, it was noted, so this one loop underground had been known for a while, Two loop and three loop had been known also for a while. 
It was noted, it has been known since the 90s, but it was noted for three loop, well, one, two, and three were available at the time by, for the true-loop integron, people who noticed that are uh, so Alde Manasena, there's a uh, Dramon, and Kaczemski, Sokachev. They noticed this explicitly before, but there was no real conceptual understanding. It was a symmetry of the theory. But yeah, the T-duality explained that. So yeah, it's noted that it was a noted for three-loop integral, and for example, the three-loop integral was expressed only in terms of so the generalization of this box integral to two-loop is that you just get these two ladders. And these you can also check that they are exactly the, dual the ladders which are invariant under inversion. And at three loops, there's a, you get the three-loop integral is a sum of permutations of these things. It's very simple, but the simplicity is explained because there's very few integrals you can write down which are invariant under inversion. <laughs> and basically all of them which you can write are this and this and their permutation. And they all occur in the three-loop integral. So it was noted there. Uh, the f this symmetry for the one-loop integral and for the ladders was noted uh, Say often the 70s noted that the, the box had this property. Uh, many people in the 90s noticed it too for the ladders. The first, I did some research, the first people who used this symmetry are Kutkowski and Wick in 54. <laughs> <laughs> they studied the ladders for Electron proton scattering, we exchange a massless scalar. They noticed it had uh, uh, this SO4, 2 symmetry. They noticed it's a bit more subtle because they have masses. It's even more subtle, but it, it's there anyway. It has these masses. They noticed that there's two points there y1, y3. If you have two points and you, uh, you have SO4 symmetry, SO, S, you have Think of this as SO6, sloppily speaking. If I give you two points in a six-dimensional vector space, you break SO6 down to SO4. This SO4 symmetry, look, when you have an electron and a proton, they like to make bound states. This SO4 symmetry is the SO4 of the hydrogen atom. So, you know that the states of the hydrogen, there's a n equal to 1, we have 1s, one then there's 2p, 2s, 3p, 3s, 3d, and there's a S, the fact that they all degenerate is explained by a SO4 symmetry. And it's exactly this symmetry. That was noted by Wigan Kutkowski. Uh, what else can I say? Yeah, we can track it, of course, if we, if we insist. We can track it back in history because, okay, this uh, SO4 in the context of the hydrogen atom is generated by angular momentum and what is called this laplace rungelange vector, which I will not write down explicitly, but you can Google it and Wikipedia will tell you what it is. Rungelange vector. And the fact that the laplace rungelange vector is conserved is the reason why the two-body problem in classical gravity, if you have two planets go around each other, they make elliptical orbits, and the orbits don't recess. So if you, if you don't have a one over hour potential, the orbits will look like that over time. They will precess. The fact they don't precess in classical mechanics is explained by the conservation of this vector. And these two guys generate this SO4. That's a statement about, about classical mechanics. So this mysterious symmetry, this, du this uh, dual conformal symmetry, is exactly the same symmetry which makes planets go round in ellipses. So yeah, it's, it's still mysterious, but okay. So there's a yeah, it's a generalization of it through through this uh, through this story. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so in the, so in the real world, this is broken by, uh, 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 it's broken at order alpha four by spin orbit effects and so on. So the, the spectrum has, a, 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 yeah, the, the energy level order m alpha square over n square, that's it. And, and then there's a correction of order alpha four, and this alpha four correction breaks the symmetry in the real world. In the n equal four model, the symmetry is present to all loop orders. So if you make a hydrogen atom in the n equals four model, and you can have massive particles using the Higgs mechanism. So yeah, I actually wrote a paper about that last summer, so uh, that's why I <laughs> say these things. If you actually make a hydrogen atom, hydrogen-like atom in n equals four, it will have the symmetry to all loop orders. This model also has it. Yeah, so uh, it differs from, it because it's not the real deal, it's not an actual photon, it's a scalar. And because of this effect, somehow there's uh, uh, and it's not, it's a scalar, it's not a Dirac fermion. So there's uh, uh, so this, uh, uh, this spin orbit interaction is gone. So, so, so this effect which break it in the real world are, are not there in this model. And they are not there in the, uh, uh, in the N equals four hydrogen-like atom. So it has this symmetry at all <laughs> yeah. yeah, so last, last summer we used this to relate uh, uh, the spec, uh, to compute the spectrum in terms of the cusp under its dimension. But I will not have, unfortunately, time, time to discuss that. But yeah, that's all for, for today. Mm -hmm.